Appreciate that song, Janet. Thank you for that. You know, singing is uh, one of those things that you can be a great singer or you can be a poor singer, and God still gets the glory. God doesn't care whether how talented or not. Uh, God gets the glory. I'm sure some of the Old Testament saints that sang there with Asaph uh, probably weren't always the best of singers, but God got the glory out of out of it, and so always good to always good to, to hear that, Jane. I appreciate that song. If you would take your Bibles to Romans chapter five, we'll be in part two tonight of Romans chapter five. The last time I spoke, uh, we started Romans chapter five with part one, and we talked about how we stand before God justified, and the reasoning we stand before Him justified is because we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the why. How is it, why is it, I should say, that we can stand before a holy God justified uh, upon not our own merits, but the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ? A f- passage of Scripture every one of us can quote, John three sixteen: For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Every one of us knows this passage of Scripture. We can quote it. We read it, it's in the back of our mind, it's second nature. In fact, even lost people know this passage of Scripture. Many lost people can quote this. If anything, it is probably the one passage of Scripture amongst all of mankind that is seen the most or heard the most. Think about it. Yeah, as somebody who watches sports, you almost every single time when I watch a sports, you always see somebody with the sign uh, in the background holding up John 3, 16. It's almost everywhere. Um, I don't go to concerts, but I've seen in photos that people who go to concerts, there's usually somebody standing outside holding up John 3, 16. John 3, 16, it's advertised all throughout our world. And many times we walk by it, maybe not the believers so much, but rather lost folks, walk by it and out of care in the world. I am reminded when the Roman soldiers were casting lots at the feet of Jesus, and you see that it's prophesied in Psalm 22, and I'm reminded by the fact that here these Roman soldiers were gambling at the feet of Jesus, and what they were essentially doing is they were gambling away their own salvation. Jesus was right there, and they were gambling it away. Not a care in the world, not a thought in mind. Yet we see this passage of Scripture all throughout our world, even amongst lost folks. But within John 3, 16, we find something very clear that it's a passage of Scripture with great depth. Great depth. We see that Jesus Christ gave himself up for the sin of the world, willingly sacrificing himself. In Luke 22, verse 42, you don't have to go there, but it says this. This is what Jesus was praying in the garden in Gethsemane, and he says this, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was asking the Father, Lord, if this be your will, take the cup from me. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross at first. But he says very clearly, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, if this is your will, I'll do it. It was the Father's will. Christ willingly gave his life for the sin of the world, and he accomplished God's will, God's plan for his life. Not an easy task. Not something that we want to put ourselves in. None of us here want to willingly sacrifice our life for any individual. And we're going to talk about that later on. But it's also interesting that when Jesus was praying to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see something different on the cross. In John 19, 20 through 30, the Bible says this, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar, and they put it upon a hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Jesus had asked the Father, Lord, remove this cup from me. But that wasn't the Father's will. The Father's will was that he was going to keep his promises as he gave in the Old Testament. And Jesus willingly gave his life so that you and I, both past, present, and future, of all mankind, every male and female, could come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We talked the last time I preached. We stand before God justified because we place our faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. But tonight, why is that possible? 
Why is it that we can stand amongst a holy God, just, perfect, and right? That God has forgiven you and I and all of mankind of all of our sins. A pastor mentioned it this morning, a passage of scripture in James, for we keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, we're guilty of all. Every one of us, that includes every one of us, myself included. And so Jesus willingly gives his life on the cross so that you and I can have eternal salvation. And as I already mentioned, the why. Why is that possible? If you're able to and willing, please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. We're going to be starting at verse 6, and we're going to read verses 6 through 11. Starting in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Thank you. You may be seated. There, the Bible is very clear, and I'm going to share with you something that we're, not, we're all very familiar with. The Bible says, for we, all, uh, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us has fallen short. No man, no woman can get to heaven or be in perfect relationship with God upon their own merit. It's impossible. Baptism can't save us. Baptism does not wash away our sins. Uh, putting our paycheck in the tithe does not save us. Reading our Bible daily does not save us. Uh, spending time in prayer uh, does not save us. We know these things, and while the, all these things are important, they're essential to the life of a believer in order for us to grow and to mature in our faith, we know that we can't do anything upon our own merit. For by, you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we know this very clearly, that all of mankind has fallen short. We're also familiar in Isaiah 64, for we are all as unclean things. And all of our, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Our righteousness has even fallen short. By the way, the, the Bible term for righteousness, in my estimation, is basically the mindset of doing right according to the Word of God. That's God's righteousness. Those things that are right according to the Word of God. But the Bible says in Isaiah 64, verse 6, that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. What mankind says is good is not good. What man's uh, ideology is, is not good. It's as filthy rags. It has fallen short. We see that in the New Testament when the Pharisees, they were bringing upon themselves the traditions of men, and they were, they were more concerned about their laws rather than the law of God. They were adding upon such things. They were taking advantage of the, of, of the poor and of those who were, who were lame. They were taking advantage of such things because they were more concerned about their righteousness and not God's. And I want you to think about this. All of this because of verse 6. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We have all fallen short. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, and Christ died for the ungodly. My first thought for tonight, Christ died for the ungodly. That includes everybody, myself included. We have all fallen short, and our methods and our ways by no means can get us close to God. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, and the righteousness of God is the only thing that allows us to draw close to God. It's, no inter it's, no, it's, not a, it's not something that we're unfamiliar with, that there are many people today who have religions or beliefs that are trying to get close to God. We run it across all the time. If you've ever done door knocking, you find this very common. People are always trying to find their way to God. We know since the fall of man that mankind has been separated from God. And since that day, mankind has been trying to restore that fellowship back with God. Sadly, we find, even with Cain, that there was mankind choosing to find his restoration in fellowship with God to be something of his own merit, not what God wanted. And so because of this, we see all throughout history that mankind has been trying to get back to God 
but doing so upon their own merit or upon their own belief or upon their own ideology. Well, the Bible is very clear about this issue. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Our redemption is because of Jesus Christ. Christ willingly gave his life on the cross for the ungodly. Notice in verse 7, he says this, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Think about this. We would consider the fact that for one righteous man we would die for. That's what he says. For when we are, verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. But he also says, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But for somebody who's good, we would consider to die for. Think about this for just a moment. Christ did not die for the righteous or for good men. He died for the ungodly. And let's, let's take this a step further. Let's say for one moment that you had a son. And in this son, you're willingly giving him up to die not for a righteous man, not even for a good man, but for the ungodly. Think about it. God sent his son to die for the ungodly. Imagine if you were to take your son and you were to say, hey, I have to give up my son for the homosexuals. Hey, listen, for those who have, have, have changed their natural being to, to, to lust after the, 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 the things that they should not, you're going to have to give up your son to die for them. That's what Christ did. Or, or, or for the drunk who scams people out of money, or for the drunk who scams people to, to take advantage of, and to use that money and to purchase it for more alcohol, your son's going to have to die for them. Or for those who, who are not willing, they, they live an immoral lifestyle, a lifestyle that is completely and totally contrary to God, you're going to have to die for them. Christ didn't die for the righteous. He didn't die for the good men. He died for the ungodly. And the fact that mankind can think that they can get to God by their own merit, we fall so short. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. We would consider to die for a righteous person, somebody who's done good in society, has done good for the things of the Lord, has been, has been a, a mentor to you or me or whoever. We would consider that. Maybe even for a good person, we would consider it. But Christ didn't do that. He, he didn't do that. He died for the ungodly, for those who were immorally, lacking immorality. And Christ died for those, for you and I. And so what we find in verse 6, when he says, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, that's exactly who he did. He died for. I would not, listen, Cody would never consider to give up my son Victor for, for, for some drunk who's, who's been nothing but, but, but a, a slack in society. I would not do it. And if you were transparent, you wouldn't give up your son for, for somebody like that. If you are, then you should be the one speaking. I wouldn't. I, I would never consider to sacrifice my only son for, for, for some a homosexual that wants to defy the things of God. I would not do it. Christ did. God did. He gave his only begotten son. We would, we would consider that fact for a righteous person, even for a good person, but for the ungodly, no. It would never cross my mind. That's the last thing I would do. But God did it. God was willing to do it. And Christ was willing to answer the call that his father gave him to go to the cross on Calvary. He says very clearly in verse, seven, or verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know why we can stand before God just? It's because Christ did it. Not you and I, but he did so for you and I. Think about this. He also says in verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood. You know what the most difficult passage of Scripture, in my opinion, is? This is in Romans chapter 9. I think it's a very difficult passage of Scripture. In Romans chapter 9, we find the heart of Paul. And Paul, you don't have to go there. Paul, what he was basically talking about, he says he, he wished he could have cursed himself from Christ for his own kinship and his own brethren. What Paul was saying is, hey, listen, I wish I could give up my own salvation for my kinsmen, for the Jews, for my people. He, was, he, he had the heart 
of, of, of Christ in his life. That he'd be willing to give up his life so that his brethren, his kinsmen, could come to know Christ. That's not an easy task. That's not something that is common to think about. It's already difficult enough to go out and evangelize and to share Christ with people, but to give up our own life, to give up our own gift that God has given us for another, especially for those who are ungodly, for those who have fallen short, we would never think about it. I know I would never think about it. And yet we need to be reminded that in Jesus Christ we are fulfilled. Notice he says, much more than being now justified by his blood. You know, we were running into an error today, a problem today. Many people don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a common theme. There are many preachers, many teachers who are not concerned about the truth of the scriptures, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not here to make a debate about King James or, or other translations. My, I have a simple point. But if you were to go into Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The Bible is very clear that we are redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ and we have forgiveness of sins because of the blood. Now, I'm not making an argument that this is a different whole King James issue. The point I'm trying to make is this. If you were to look at other translations, a lot of them take out the blood in Colossians 1, 14. Listen, we're living in a society where preachers want nothing to do with the blood. There are some that say, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins, they take out the blood. And the problem is, is the blood is not important no more. The blood is, in fact, very important. He says very clearly in verse 9, justified by well, whose blood? His blood. Not mine, not your, his blood. The shedding of Jesus Christ on the cross, when he shed his blood on Calvary, that's, that was important. He, he, he gave it all. He, he was willing to, he took the cup. He took it all. I believe when you read Psalm 22 and he talks about that, that water uh, in his body, I believe that the, Jesus, when he was on the cross, I believe he shed every ounce of blood on Calvary. I don't think there was a blood, uh, an ounce of blood left in Jesus. In Psalm 22, it talks about the water that poureth out and his bones wax, joint, or his, his, his joints uh, wax. And I believe that the moment that Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, he, 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 he gave and shed all of his blood on Calvary for you and I. We are justified by his blood. You know why we can stand before Jesus or before God justified, perfect? It's because of the blood shed of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not on our own merit, but by, but by Jesus Christ. And so we stand before God justified because of what Jesus has done, not what man has done. I mentioned last time I speak, spoke that in this chapter we find the doctrine of justification. We saw it in verse 1, therefore being justified by faith. Well, the moment somebody places their faith in Jesus, we are justified. But he also says in verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood. We're justified because we place our faith in Jesus, but the reason being is because Jesus shed his blood on Calvary. And so we need to be reminded that when we make the decision, when an individual makes the decision to place their faith in Jesus Christ, it is the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ that saves that individual. It washes them, it cleanses them spiritually, not physically. <laughs> was this not the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus? Hey, D Nicodemus was confused about the idea of being born again. And so Nicodemus is like, I, I, Lord, I can't climb back in my mother's room and be born again, right? It can't happen. And Jesus makes it very clear to him, you must be born of water and of the Spirit. And those that are born of water and water and of Spirit and of Spirit. And so we understand that the moment an individual receives Christ as Lord and Savior, that they are born again within the Spirit. The body doesn't change. The physical being doesn't change. Therefore, if any man being Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The body remains the same, but inwardly, we become a new creature in Christ. And Nicodemus, he, he struggled with this at first, but I believe that when Christ began to expound upon this topic with him, he began to become familiar. I was sharing this, well, he's not here no more, Brother Tyrone. It was I shared it with Pastor this week. I don't know why this, I've never caught this before. And you ever read your Bible, and you're reading it, and you come across a passage of Scripture, and you're like, wow, I never saw this before. Like, I, I never, like, how did I miss this? And I can't, I've read John many times, and I was in John chapter 19, and I remember reading about when they were going to get the body of Jesus from Pilate, and Joseph of Aramaeus, and Nicodemus. 
Nicodemus was one of the other individuals that was trying to retrieve the body uh, of Jesus Christ in John chapter 19, uh, verse 39. You see that very clearly. and I, I, It was something that amazed me. I begin to think about this. Nicodemus, here he was having this incredible conversation with the Lord. And all the in-between, we know nothing about. And here we see Nicodemus, one of the two men, uh, with Joseph of Aramath, going to retrieve the body of Jesus. Listen, I don't know what was going on through Nicodemus. That was during those three years. I don't know what happened. By the way, we know that Jesus probably died about 33 and a half years of age because the Bible tells us he began his earthly ministry at the age of 30. Then when you get to the book of John, you count the Passovers. There's three Passovers. That's how we know Jesus was about 33 years of age. Um, and so we find that Nicodemus, I wonder what was going on between those three years with Nicodemus. The conversation he had with the Lord about being born again. And here Nicodemus says, after the death of of the Lord Jesus Christ, and here he tries to receive the body of Jesus Christ. I believe Nicodemus is in heaven today. I believe we'll see him in glory. Yes. No man is going to do that. A, a, a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, to go get and retrieve the body of Jesus Christ? Listen, a saved first person is going to do that. But here's my thought. Nicodemus, I wonder, I don't know this for certain, but I have to believe it, that Nicodemus understood the purpose of being born again of the Spirit because he shed his blood on Calvary. And I wonder if all the Old Testament that he knew of, and he began to look in Psalm chapter 22, or in Isaiah 53, or Zechariah chapter 9, and I wonder, or Malachi chapter 5, and he began to read those Old Testament prophecies and think, Christ, he had to come, he had to shed his blood, he had to die. We are justified because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Let no man or woman tell you otherwise that the blood is not important, because it is. We stand here redeemed because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And to think for one moment that mankind would be willing to sacrifice their life and give up their blood for a righteous man, possibly. For a good man, for a good man, possibly. But for all of mankind to be ungodly, we would never consider it. We would never consider it. It's not within who we, we, we are too self-willed. We, are, we have so much pride in our life to even consider such a thing like that. We fall so short, but we stand before God justified because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But not only that, Christ restores us. Christ restores us. Look at verses 10 and 11. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son... We were enemies, by the way. Pastor mentioned it this morning in James 4.4. 4. Uh, ye, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? And, there, and whosoever therefore is a friend of the world is the enemy of God, James 4.4. 4. We were all enemies at one point with God. The moment we were born, we were God's enemy. We were, we were conceived in sin. And, and not only is this body sinful, but our, human, our, our nature itself was cursed by sin. And so we stand before God as his enemy at one point. For when we were enemies, I can tell you now, today, for those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are no longer his enemy. We, he calls us out by name. And just like the Apostle Paul, we can call upon him, Abba, Father, by the way, it's interesting to me because the word Abba literally means daddy. Now, I believe, as the Bible says in uh, the book of Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus says, hallowed be thy name, we need to reverence the Lord. But listen, Jesus also commands us in the Sermon of the Mount that we are to go into our closet in secret and pray. And it is in those moments that we ought to have an intimate relationship with the Lord, as, as uh, the, the missionary was speaking about this morning. There, we need to have that intimate relationship with the Lord. We need to cry upon him, Abba, Father. We need, to, we, need to, we need to recognize who he is and what he has done in our life. God restores us. He says in verse 10, for when we were enemies, we were reconciled. Putting back together what belongs. It frustrated me this morning, but I'm going to use it anyways. Pastor used my illustration. I was going to use Luke 15 with the prodigal son, but I'm going to take a different approach with it. But we see restoration in the prodigal son, do we not? The son, he, he, he asked the father to divide all the, the all, half of the goods and for him to receive the one half. And he went out to, uh, to live a riotous li uh, lifestyle, a riotous lifestyle. He wanted to live how he wanted to live. And used up all his money, and 
he had nothing left, and so he was commanded to go feed the swine. He began to eat the husks just like the swine did, and he realized he had nothing. He gave it all up. He lived like the world. And here he is, he's, he's, he's trying to convince himself, and he says, you know, I need to go to the Father and ask him to forgive me for I've sinned. He goes to the Father, and before he can even say those words, the Father begins to run to him, yeah. bows down and kisses him. And the, and the prodigal son says, I've sinned. And the, we, know the, we know the count, or not the count, the, the parable. And, and, and the father commands his servants to go kill the, kill the calf. And they begin to have a feast and bring him a robe and put a ring on him. Restoration, putting back together what belongs. The son wasn't meant to be serving out in the world. He was meant to be there in fellowship with his father. You and I are not meant to be living a life consumed with the things of the world. We don't need to be involved in those kinds of things. We need to be in fellowship with the Father. And the moment we were enemies, the moment we received Christ as Lord and Savior, we no longer become his enemies, but we now become reconciled. We become reconciled. Take your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll come back to Romans chapter 5, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I believe this is an, uh, very essential to the life of a believer If you're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, notice, notice in verse 19 and 20, he says this, To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Notice there. He was trying to bring back that fellowship with the world to himself. But then he also says, Not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We have the word of reconciliation. The word of God breaks down barriers. Did you know that? I've had people ask me, they said, you know, I have a difficult time reaching this person. And, and listen, that's always going to happen. We, we're not guaranteed. The moment we share Christ, listen, I, I've shared Christ long enough, and most of you sitting here have done a plenty of sharing with Christ. You know as well as I do that just because we share Christ doesn't guarantee anything. If anything, 90% of the time, probably even a lot, lot higher, people are usually rejecting the gospel. By the way, Jesus tells us very clearly that, hey, there's going to be many people that go to hell but very few will be going to be with glory. And so we have the ministry of reconciliation. In fact, not only do we have the ministry of reconciliation, but he says, oh, I, said, I jumped, I, I meant, I said verse 19, 20. Go back at verse 18. I apologize. I jumped my verse. He says, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. We are reconciled by Jesus Christ. By the way, when we share Christ with folks, we're not sharing them to have a relationship with God. We're sharing them to have a relationship with Christ. Many people get this confused when they begin to share the gospel. The gospel is what Jesus Christ did. It's the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we believe, we need to believe that Jesus Christ is, in fact, God, and that when he died, he died so perfectly for our sin. We need to be reminded of that. So we are reconciled by the person of Jesus Christ, he says there in verse 18. And he says, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We now have the responsibility to go out, share the gospel, and to restore that perfect relationship with the Lord for those who are lost. By the way, we don't do any of the saving. Cody doesn't do any of the saving. By the way, you and I don't do any convicting. I've heard, there's a false thing that goes around a lot of times. They say you have to say certain things a certain way. You got to be this way. You got to be that way. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say, didn't Jesus say in John, and if I, if I be lifted up, will draw men unto me? Christ does the convicting, not me, not you. We need to be reminded that we need to have faith that when we share the gospel, we need to include the word of God. Because he says, if you notice, as I kind of jumped it before, but if you looked at the end of verse 19, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. It's the word of God that breaks barriers. We know Hebrews 4.12. Right? It divideth asunder between bone and, and, and joint. And he goes down the whole list. He's the discerner of the thoughts and tense of the heart. It's the word of God that's able to break down those barriers. Listen, I, I, was a, I was a 17-year-old kid. I was involved with the things of the world. I thought like the world. I didn't care what anybody had to say. Uh, and, and from a society standpoint, I, I wasn't deemed as somebody completely, totally terrible. But I look back at my life and I think how lost I was, how consumed in the world I was. I didn't care what anybody said. I spoke the way I wanted to speak. I said what I wanted to say. I was involved in things I shouldn't be involved with. And then Christ saved me. He had reconciled me. And you all here sitting have very similar testimonies. You were, you were an enemy. You lived a certain lifestyle, and then God reconciled you by Jesus Christ. And now he's committed to you and I the ministry of reconciliation. 
And we have the word of reconciliation to help those who do not know Christ. I always say, when you're sharing Christ, you need to know scripture. I believe it's important. There's power in the word. There's power in the word. We need to know scripture. I'm not saying you have to have 50 verses memorized. I'm not saying anything like that. But if you don't know scripture, bring your Bible. You should at least know where to go. Uh, Janet had asked me to put together a program for her, for her Sunday school class. And one of the things in there was, hey, learn the Roman roads. I believe that's, listen, we should all know the Roman roads. We should. If you don't, hey, listen, that's okay. Learn them now. Learn them now. It's a very simple way of going through the gospel. But we need to be familiar with Scripture, whether we know it by heart or not. We can get to it if we open up our Bible, but we need to always use the Word of God when it comes to sharing the gospel. Because we can't reconcile those who are lost if we don't use the Word of God. The Word of God is what saves us. Amen. It's what has power. It's what has the true message of the, of, the, of the gospel. So we need to use this effectively in order to share the gospel. Because he says, unto us the word of reconciliation. Now when we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We are made righteous because of what Jesus had done. We are not, God, Christ died for the ungodly, but he restores us, he reconciles us because of Jesus, not because you and I. So when we look back at Romans chapter 5, when he says, very clearly, for when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We were reconciled by the death of his son. We shall be saved by his life. And that's what we are. That's where we stand today. He says in verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we get our joy from a lot of different things, do we not? And if we're not careful, we often find joy in things we shouldn't get joy from. I'm guilty. Listen, I enjoy sports. And I'm going to use this as a, an analogy, but my team lost this weekend. It didn't bring a lot of joy in my life. You know what? How pitiful that is, truly. It's pathetic. It's a sport. Who cares? I care. <laughs> but, uh, but, but in, ultimate, in, all the grand, in all the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. That's not where my joy comes from. Our joy ought to come from God. Amen. Ought to come from our, our gift of eternal life. Habakkuk 3.18, yeah, I'll rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. We get a lot of our joy from a lot of different things. Maybe a promotion in your job. Nothing wrong with it. That's good. But that's not where our joy should come from. I got a lot of, a lot of money in my retirement. That's good. Shouldn't get our joy from it. Our house, cars. You know, think about this. Jesus Christ had no place to lay his head. The Bible says the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man have no place to lay his head. Think about this. Jesus had nothing. And, and, and he's the one who gives us joy. In the book of Philippians, he made himself of no reputation, but took upon himself the form of a servant. He made himself of no reputation. He wasn't looking for fame. He wasn't looking for fame. Jesus literally had nothing, and the apostles that followed him that he called had nothing. And where did their joy come from? Christ, and knowing Christ. Our true joy ought to come from knowing Christ. You know what? In Galatians, you're very familiar with, uh, familiar with this, the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, uh, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And here's what's interesting about that. We always think about the, the nine words that he gives us regarding the fruit of the Spirit. But you know what he says at the end of verse 23? Against such there is no law. Meaning this. These nine things, there is no rule in life, there is no law in society that oversees these nine things. These nine things, the fruit of the Spirit, this is the only thing that God cares about in our life. We need to have the fruit of the Spirit. We need to have all nine of these things in our life. If we're going to have if we're going to have joy in our life. Because remember, um, in verse 26 of that same chapter, if you read in Galatians 5, at the very end of verse 26, or sorry, at the beginning of verse 26, the Bible says this, let us not be desirous of vain glory. Because when he gets done with the fruit of the Spirit, he begins to tell us, hey, we need, to, we need not to walk in the flesh, but we need to walk in the Spirit. 
That's what he says right after that. And then in, the, in, in verse 26, the end of chapter 5, he says, very clear, let us not be desirous of vain glory. Yet, where do we get our glory from? Are we getting our glory from the things of the world or from the things of God? And if we're not careful, we'll begin to get our glory from those things that are within the world. Our true joy comes from knowing Christ. He says, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, the atonement here, I believe, is just another word for reconciliation. We are atoned in Jesus Christ. We are reconciled. But we need to, re we need to be reminded that, listen, even though God restores the ungodly, there's still a responsibility you and I have when it comes to following Jesus. We don't get to live our life however we want. We don't. In fact, take your Bibles to the book of James. James chapter 5. I want to share this with you because I think it's important. In James chapter 4, I apologize. James chapter 4, he says this in verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But then he says this, For what is your life? It is even a vapor and appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. Our life, we don't know what goes on for tomorrow. Hey, listen, God saved us. God restores us because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. But why then will we begin to live our life however we want? We, we don't have that privilege. We shouldn't, have, we shouldn't be taking advantage of God's gift for us. We don't know what's going on tomorrow for what is your life? What is our life? What, what have we committed to? Hey, God saves us. He restores us. But are we committed to things that we should be? Prayer life, Bible reading, holy living, evangelism. By the way, the Bible says do the work of an evangelist. We all have the responsibility to evangelize. When Jesus gave the great commission there in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, verse 18, he says, all power is given on me in heaven and hell. All right, and then he says, go ye therefore. He gave that institutionally, by the way. Think about that. He gave that institutionally. He gave it to the apostles who were the foundation to the church. The, the apostles were individuals, but the, the, the apostles made up the church at that time. So it was given to every single individual, the church as a whole, but it was also the responsibility of the apostles to go out and evangelize. It was given institutionally. And so when we begin to look at our life, have we evangelized like we should? Have we been committed to the ministry of reconciliation like we should? Listen, I'd be the first one to stand up here and tell you, that I've not always been faithful to the ministry of reconciliation. And if I'm the only one, then, then you all should be up here preaching. Because I think if we were all transparent, we've all at times have not taken the opportunity like we should. We've been reconciled. God restores us. I think what happens is this, and here's my thought, and then I'll end. We have forgotten at times, if we're not careful, who had the boldness to share to you and I the Jesus Christ and had the faith to do what God had asked them to do? And I think we have forgotten at times. I'm not saying, I'm just saying this in a generic statement. We have forgotten at times the faithfulness of those people who took the time to share us, to tell us about Jesus. How often do we tell others about Jesus like we should? I'm not talking about going on Facebook, putting up a message, or, or leaving a track uh, on somebody's door. Those are all good things. Do not misunderstand. But when was the last time? Ask yourself this. When was the last time you had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, whether they received it or not, about telling somebody about Jesus Christ? When was the last time? Because if we're not careful, we forget what we were called for, what we're supposed to be doing. He saved us. We were ungodly, unfit, unfit, to have perfect fellowship with God. So God had to send his son. He died. He shed his blood. He not only died for the ungodly, he not only restores us, but then he gives us the ministry. And how often do we put it aside? When was the last time you handed out a track and said, hey, I'd like to invite you to church. If you don't mind, can I tell you what, what this track has to say? When was the last time you said, hey, do you mind if I share a piece of scripture with you? pastor uh, was out, I, I came home, I, I forget what day it was, this was last week, and one of those uh, house, or roof salesmen came up to Brother Barry, 
and I just pulled in, and he was talking to him, and uh, he was somebody uh, very similar to my age, and he, he, he saw me walk, pulling out of my car, and he's like, hey, you work out. Not really, but I try. And um, we began having a conversation, and I began to talk to him, and he lives out in Westchester, and I asked him this question. I said, because he was telling me how he grew up in church, I asked him this question. I said, you said, you're, you, said you believe, but let me ask you a question. What do you believe regarding salvation? How do you get to heaven? That's what I asked him. And here's what his response was. He said, well, I think that trying to be a good person and reading your Bible and praying and doing those things, I think is, is going to get me to heaven. It's not. Began to share with him the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he was amazed. He never heard about it. This was a guy, by the way, who grew up in church. Now, he was out, he's been out of church for a little while, but grew up in church. I don't know what church he grew up in, but they weren't preaching the truth. And I shared with him Jesus Christ, and he almost came to know Christ. He didn't. But I walked away thinking, how many people in our society today have that same viewpoint? Hey, I just got to be a good person. I just got to do what's right. It's not. It's not. We can't do it on our own merit. God restores us because of Jesus Christ. You know, in a message like this, what can we take away from it? Of course, the first thing is, has God restored you? Maybe you're sitting here and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'd tell you tonight's the night to do it, to place your faith in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ alone is the only thing that's going to give you a perfect relationship with God. And secondly, have you committed to the ministry of reconciliation? Let us not forget the faithfulness of a man or woman, whoever shared to you Jesus Christ. I'll be done with this one thing. I, I, I've had my heart broken because we recently had to take off uh, Brother Taylor there out of New York because he has gone a direction that is not biblical. That man was the one who led me to the Lord. And I think about, has he forgotten has he forgotten? So many people today have. And we need to be reminded that God has saved us. He restores us. And we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Let us be faithful to go out and share Jesus Christ like we should. Our Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, Lord. Lord, I'm thankful that we see in Romans chapter 5 how God not only just dies for the ungodly, or how he did die for the ungodly, for all of mankind, but how he restores us through the shed blood of your son. Lord, I pray that we would have a burden in our heart and a desire to be more faithful when it comes to sharing Jesus Christ with others. Because, Lord, there's so many people out there who are lost, who are desperate, who do not know the truth, and yet they're sitting around our, our neighborhoods, and they're, 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 they're maybe even our neighbors, and have never heard the gospel. Lord, I pray that we would have the faithfulness and the boldness to, to share with them the need of salvation in their life. Lord, we're not guaranteed results, and that's fine. But let us just have the faith to remain faithful to what you've asked us to do. Lord, I pray that we'd be the people that you've called us to be in loving and serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able to and willing, please stand on page 591. Have thy own way, Lord.